appreciated them. Um, so yeah, fine kind about of adieu. We'll move on to um, our last sort of official speaker slot today, and that is Alex Wade. Um, he's doing a Christmas edition of the Pest Quiz. I think some of you might have remembered one that Alex done uh, not too long ago. Maybe it was the first or second forum that we've done. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So I'm going to get involved myself. Um, Alex, if you can pop up and yeah, tell us what it's all about. Hi guys. Well, it's uh, it's uh, a not a Christmas themed quiz, but it certainly is a quiz at Christmas. So <laughs> We, um, shall we get started with this? It should be relatively simple. So hopefully, uh, in just a moment's time, you should see the first slide. Now, how this is going to work is I'll ask a question. There'll be a series of multiple choice answers. And then um, my wonderful assistant behind the scenes will pop up a, uh, a question uh, or a series of questions for you to answer on the poll. So I think we have an example one right now that we can just give a bit of a go to. So generally speaking, we're going to give you about 20 to 30 seconds to answer these questions. Uh, I'll do a bit of padding in the meantime or just, you know, sit and look pretty. Um, and, and then after we get the answers, we can we can do some discussions. And uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, chuck them into the QA or the chat at this point. And I'm sure someone, Mice Krispies, absolutely. They sound fantastic, don't they? Um, I definitely want the recipe for those if there is such a thing. And I'm sure, <laughs> I am sure there is somewhere. Okay, so without further ado, shall we have some questions? So question number one on the section for vertebrates. What are the long hairs protruding from a rat's coat called? Is it A, sentinel hairs, B, warning hairs, C, touchy-feely hairs, or D, guard hairs? At this point, I, I really should... Um, really should have some kind of countdown music that we could do, but unfortunately, I don't think we have that. So, as we get started. And I think we're just about there. So, what did everyone say? Sentinel hairs. Actually, um, it, it's, it's guard hairs. Um, but I, I can see where the confusion with that came about, because it's... Uh, both of those um, are very similar words. So the guard hairs on a rodent's coat actually allow it to um, ascertain how closely it's running alongside something or if it's having to squeeze through a gap that necessarily might be too small. Uh, and it's all part of a, a system within that rodent's biology called the Vibrissi system, uh, which is also linked to their um, whiskers on their face. So next question along, what is the term for when rodents run alongside things? Is it thigmataxis, geotaxis, ubertaxis, or phototaxis? So you see this a lot um, uh, when rodents are moving along the habitual routes, and it's, it's what actually causes the, the leaving of these greasy smears, is this propensity to run alongside objects. Uh, and they do it a lot. It's a, you know, it's a fairly common behaviour. It's why they prefer wall floor junctions. Uh, and it's it's driven by a couple of things, but um, it, it's it's mostly because if you're running alongside something, there is significantly less risk of being jumped on by something from that direction because you've got a solid object to your to your side. So, should we see some of the answers for this? What did everyone get? Oh, it's it's thigmataxis. So geotaxis is, um, so the word taxis means um, it, it's, a, it's a movement in reaction to a stimulus. So taxis is, is the movement and the, you know, the, the, oops, can we have those? All right, yeah, sorry. And the, the thank you. <laughs> As you know, I can, I can do this, can't I? So thigmataxis uh, is the answer. Thigo, thigmo means touch. So it's a movement in response to touch. Um, geotaxis is a movement in response to um, gravity or height, and uh, phototaxis is a movement in response to light. So phototaxis is uh, important when you're looking have, uh, having a look at things like weeds and herbicides. Geotaxis actually is one that you might come across when you're looking at things like SBIs, especially grain weevils. Um, they are geotaxic. They tend to migrate and move up. 
Uh, and Uber Taxis is a service you get when you are absolutely hammered at one o'clock in the morning. So, so there we go. Um, rodents have an additional sense of smell. Um, and I've mentioned this before, and I think this might have even been in, in my last quiz, so points for those who can remember it. But what is the organ called that provides this additional sense of smell? Is it the Jacobson's organ, uh, the vermisonderal organ, the larynx, or the epiglottis? Okay, and this is this is fantastic. If you guys haven't heard of this, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but it's, it's a fantastic little bit of um, science. Uh, this organ allows them to smell proteins and pheromones in the urine and the saliva and the feces of other rodents. And actually this um, uh, being able to smell these proteins and these pheromones allows rats to communicate a huge amount of information between each other, um, such as age, sex, uh, sexual reproduction, um, sexual sort of receptivity, whether or not they actually are pregnant, what they ate, whether or not they're stressed, who they are, like individual recognition. Um, so as I said before, when you see urine pillars for mice, um, that's not just them, you know, making urine pillars to be grotty little buggers. Um, it's actually Twitter for mice. When you find latrine piles of rats, um, that's Facebook. <laughs> this is them communicating and letting each other know uh, about their world and about what's safe and what's not and what's going on. So which of these did we, um, which of these did we think it was? Yes, there we go, uh, the phosphonal organ. So the Jacobson's organ actually is um, a very similar organ, but it's found in reptiles. And so when you see a reptile flicking its tongue out and its forked tongue, it has two pits on the roof of its mouth, which have a very similar function and it's pressing its tongue against those pits, which is telling it whether or not these pheromones or these proteins are coming from left or right. Uh, of course, this is your larynx and your epiglottis is the little bit that hangs down at the back of your neck. <laughs> so there we go. What is the smallest species of rodent in the UK? Uh, is it the harvest mouse, the bank vole, the dormouse or the house mouse? So. Uh, I, I will give you a clue. Um, the smallest species is not a pest species. <laughs> so it's a, it's a non-target species. Uh, and if any of you guys have ever been to Church Farm when it was operational, uh, we used to have big colonies of these out at the front. Uh, and they are quite frankly adorable. Uh, is, you know, but that's, uh, that's the limit to the, um, the clues I will give you on this. Uh, and, and they really are quite tiny. Uh, if you ever have the privilege of finding one. They are, um, you know, only a little bit bigger than the knuckle of your thumb. They are uh, quite adorable. Yes, of course, it's the harvest mouse, uh, whose actual Latin name is um, Micromus, which literally means tiny mouse. So there we go. Which of these insects doesn't go through a complete metamorphosis? Uh, is it the fur beetle, a fly, bed bug, or mosquito? So this is going to be a little bit as to how well you understand your um, biological cycles here. Um, and I don't think I'd be cheating too much if I explain, you know, complete metamorphosis is when a an insect will go through several distinct life cycles. So realistically, um, what you're looking for here in your answer is which of these animals has um, larval or nymphal stages, which look almost identical to the adult, and do they not move through, um, you know, a, a metamorphosis period? So that should have given you the answer. So I'm, I'm hoping to see 100% across the board there, guys. Yes, near, near enough, near enough. It is, of course, the bed bug. So, of course, fur beetles uh, come from the, um, like, the order, order sorry, the, uh, they come from Coleoptera, and so they have um, a larvae um, which will move through and it will destroy um, stored products or stored you know, leathers and uh, other bits and bobs like that. Uh, and then they will go through a pupil phase and then they will become an adult which looks distinguished as a significantly different from that larval stage. The same, of course, is with flies and mosquitoes, which have a distinct larval stage compared to their, their adult stages. So, which of these cockroaches is known for carrying its uathiki with it uh, until that uathiki catches? So um, uathiki is, sorry, brown-banded, American, Oriental, or German. Um, 
others, you know, brown banded, you might always also refer to that as a uh, supella. Um, this is, a, you know, just on a little tangent, this is why actually using um, common names isn't, isn't so good because there can be a lot of confusion, a lot of colloquialisms around um, how we describe animals. Uh, for example, I keep a lot of tarantulas and the number of red kneed tarantulas out there that are completely different species it is phenomenal. Uh, and so we always sit here and we bang on about learning your little bits of Latin and your binomial nomoculture. Uh, but in reality, it, it's a really important um, task, especially when you're dealing with people who may be from other cultures, because what they may refer to as a brown banded cockroach, they may have a completely different name for it. But that name, Supella, would be the same um, everywhere, um, so long as they, they know it. So it, it takes some of the confusion out of it, uh, certainly for you and certainly for anyone who's reading your reports. So a little bit of Latin or a little bit of Greek goes a long way. There we go. German cockroaches. So they will carry their uathikis around with them clasped uh, a, you know, out of the, the void in the back of their abdomen for uh, a significant period of time. And it, it will start to rupture and hatch just, just as they um, uh, drop it onto the floor. Uh, Americans tend to try and stick theirs underneath things if they can. Orientals will just um, scatter them as, as they go. Uh, and brown banders are similar to the Americans, but their their Othiki are actually quite cute. They're almost cubic uh, in in proportions, whereas the other the other two, the other three, tend to be much more elongated. Okay, so this is a bit of a fun one. Um, how does a water boatman make sound? Uh, does it rub its wings together? Does it rub its legs on its abdomen? Does it rub its legs on its wings? Or does it rub its penis on its abdomen? So. Uh, I mean, while, while you all contemplate just how water boatmen uh, make sweet, sweet music to each other, um, the water boatman is actually um, for size proportionally one of the loudest animals on earth. So uh, a water boatman or a species of water boatman that's about two millimeters long actually is producing a sound that's roughly about 98 decibels, um, which is phenomenal considering that the loudest animal on the planet is uh, the blue whale. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, something like 160 to 170 decibels. Um, it is a logarithmic scale, but at the same time, when you're two millimeters long, being able to make a noise that you can hear from the bank when that animal's underwater is actually um, phenomenal. Uh, and, you know, much in the way that BuzzFeed draws you in, the answer will shock and amaze you. So, yes, a fairly, fairly even spread here, but that's, 33% of you who are clearly deviants are actually <laughs> correct. Um, it rubs its penis across its abdomen. And to be honest, if I could do that, I probably would make a noise around about the 98 decibel range as well. So, so there we go. Right, back to some more serious questions. Under optimal conditions of roughly about 25 degrees centigrade, how quickly can a fruit fly complete its life cycle? Is it ten, uh, six to eight days? eight to 10 days, 10 to 12 days, or 12 to 14 days. So while we discuss this, this is, this is actually, I mean, you might consider this to be a bit of a, a nuance. Um, why, why necessarily does it matter uh, how quickly these guys can do things? Um, but I will show you a slide just after this that um, describes just how important it is to keep these things in mind, especially when we are um, discussing with our clients how best to manage these problems in a long-term solution, um, because some of these life cycles are, are, are actually very, very rapid. I mean, talking about cockroaches, it, it's in the scales of months, but you can see here, um, even at you know the top end of our answers, we were talking days. And animals that live in waste and fermenting waste mean that if uh, your client doesn't have a good handle on their hygiene and housekeeping, um, you are going to be persistently having to deal with those issues. So what does everyone reckon this was? Six to eight days. Well, that, that is remarkably fast. At 28, uh, sorry, 25 degrees, um, the book cited temperature is actually 10 to 12 days. Uh, and that's for the full life cycle to complete. Uh, you can see here, actually, that six to eight days it is all, almost correct because that's from embryo back to adult at that point. Um, but just to say here, you can see from an egg to a pupa, which is actually quite resistant, they're, they're quite water 
um, water resistant and so they can be quite um, resistant to some of our treatments, you are talking less than a week. So if your client is only taking their bins out or only having their bins changed uh, once a week or even once a fortnight, we can get a full uh, generational cycle involved uh, in that time. And so all you're ever going to be doing is cropping that population, never actually dealing with um, the bit that is hidden in the bins. So on to a little bit of general knowledge now. What is the term that best describes when rodents are most active? Is it A, diurnal, B, nocturnal, C, crispuscular, or D, vespertine? And with that, I mean, I won't give you uh, which of these terms is correct, but we will talk a little bit about um, rodent behavior. So rodents will be most active at a time that I will describe in a minute. But it's quite interesting because they will go through um, two different types of um, activity peaks. Um, and it, well, when we get the answer to this, it's quite interesting, but it's, it is, in all intents and purposes, a defense mechanism um, for uh, rodents. Um, they are choosing times which are best suited to their behavior or their biological shortcomings. Um, rodents are, or brown rats especially, are incredibly, um, you know, they're, they're not visually acute. They are near as damn it blind. Uh, and, and so you don't necessarily want to be operating at times of, you know, the day and night where you, your, your, your blindness is a, a disadvantage and the ability to see is an advantage to others. Um, I've seen something pop up in the chat. Is that for me? Am I breaking up? So there we go. Nocturnal is, is one of them. It's actually somewhere between, and I'll put nocturnal and crispicular. This was a bit of a, a mean one. Um, it is somewhere between nocturnal and crispicular. So the word crispicular means mostly active at dawn and dusk. So if you have a look at rodent behaviors, although they are active um, mostly throughout the night, there are significant peaks of activity uh, around dawn and dusk. Uh, and this is because during the day, you have a lot of diurnal predators who are um, very visually acute. Um, we're talking buzzards, we're talking species of hawks, uh, human beings. Uh, we, we are all very visually acute. And at night, you have the same thing. You have um, barn owls, you have owls which are also very visually acute. And for an animal that is not relying on its sense of sight, you want to try and pick a time frame where you're not necessarily going to have that disadvantage. So they have these peaks of activity around dawn and dusk where your diurnal predators are winding down and your nocturnal predators are winding up. And, and they will be, there will be a, a, a level of activity um, throughout the night that is actually greater than during the day, but there are certainly these two peaks. Um, and I tell you this because it means if you're ever having real issues understanding how rodents are behaving on a site, if you've got a particularly tricky site, it might be worth trying to organize a site visit around those times, because those are the times when you're going to actually probably have the highest likelihood of seeing rodents moving out of harborage and through these habitual runs. So crispicular, a uh, wonderful word. Now, which of these products or which of these um, uh, application methods produces the smallest droplet size? Uh, is it ULVs, thermal fogs, aerosols or compression sprays. So this is a, you know, if we were to go back, you know, even five or six years ago, um, you know, th these application methods were, oh, well, that just clicked by accident. So if anyone, uh, <laughs> they just got the answer there. Um, no idea how that happened. I apologize greatly. Uh, so yes, if you were to imagine this, um, uh, and I'm going to use my hands as, as a rough estimate here, so use um, very, very large droplet sizes. I mean, huge. Uh, you can you can visibly see them with your eyes, and if you've got your too low, they will literally bomb or, or just come out as a, a set stream. So you're talking big, big droplet sizes. Aerosols um, also will produce relatively large droplet sizes. Um, you, you can see even those, you can just about there at the, the apex of your vision. Mm -hmm. Now with ULVs, we are talking very small, very small droplet sizes. But with thermal fogs, 
they are they are microscopic. They are absolutely tiny. We are measuring these in microns at this point. So thermal fogs have uh, a very very small droplet size. It allows them to be incredibly pervasive into the environment. They can fit into very small gaps. Um, downside of that is they can drift an incredibly long way. It's one of the reasons that thermal fogging um, is used for actually. Um, vector control programs. You can push, um, you can use a thermal fog and you can get it to drift considerable distance. So a lot of the vector control programs out in the Middle East, where you're looking at trying to control mosquitoes over a large geographic uh, um, arena, um, will use things like thermal fogs because they have this ability to drift and persist in the air. Now, one back to where we should all, all be a bit more familiar. What does the word rodenta mean? Does it mean to eat from man's table? Does it mean to gnaw, to dig, or to hide? Unfortunately, I don't think we have any way of keeping track on, uh, on who's, who's got the right answers or not on this. Um, so you're going to have to be very honest at the end and when I ask you what you've got. Um, but let's, uh, let's uh, get to the end first and see how, how we're all feeling about this. So this should be a fairly, fairly easy one. Um, to gnaw, yes, there we go. To eat from man's table is, is commensal, uh, is, is the term for that. And actually, I really do like the term commensal, even though it may be uh, a little bit um, uh, anachronous. Um, but Commensal rodents are to eat from man's table. Well, the word rodenta quite literally means from um, the Latin to gnaw. And of course, that's what they're doing. Their behavior of their teeth, these incisors that are constantly um, growing, need to be kept in check. They need to be ground down occasionally to keep them sharp and to keep them aligned. So a behavior through all rodents is this propensity to, to gnaw on things. Now, this one will separate those who probably have children from those that don't. Um, what is the name of the rat in the film Ratatouille? Is it Remy, Stuart, Mickey, or Marcel? So if, I, if you haven't seen the film Ratatouille, um, it, it is clearly an educational guide on pest control. Um, and that's what you should be telling your coworkers and boss when you find yourself watching it at lunchtime tomorrow. Um, Realistically, it's just a, you know, it's a food about glaringly awful food standards in a French uh, restaurant. So there we go. But what is the name of the rat in Ratatouille? Mm. More of you than I would have thought got that right. Yes, it's Remy. Um, Stuart, of course, Stuart Little, Mickey Mouse and Marcel. Um, is the monkey from Friends. So um, we, we can see who of you watch Friends and not uh, Pixar movies there. Now, this is a bit of a pitch around, uh, and I'm expecting nobody to get this right on purpose, unless anyone who's um, been to one of my lectures before. But um, this um, black smear here, what is this animal? Is this animal a house mouse, a brown rat, a field mouse, or a gray squirrel? Uh, and, and this, um, I hasten to add, isn't a photo I've doctored, and this isn't a photo um, that is being taken out of context. Um, this was actually sent to me by one of my friends who works uh, on uh, the national rail lines. And this is um, the inside of a switching board on, on the rail lines. So, so these are all of the uh, different power distribution um, cables for, I think, moving the tracks uh, around and making sure that the tracks are pointing in the right direction when you have a train coming along. Uh, and although we can sit here and have a bit of a giggle about how this once was an animal, you can see here that actually this is a, a, a clear and present danger. Um, at, at, you know, at best, this animal could have caused a fire, and at worst, it could have caused a train to derail um, at this point. Uh, and so these, these um, rodents, this propensity to gnaw, um, especially on um, objects which have multiple textures, uh, things such as wires, can be a real danger. Uh, and this, you can see this distribution board, it, it's got a, a solid wood back on the back. You can see all of the terminals and connections there. They're hardened against um, 
you know, high currents and potentially fire. Um, but when you get such uh, events happening in domestic residences where you don't have these kinds of safeguards or in agricultural areas where you don't have the same kind of um, backups and redundancies, um, these could very quickly become big fires, big problems in relatively short order, uh, especially as there are, there are some houses out there that um, have insulations stuffed within their wall voids, um, which may or may not be fire retardant because at the time that they were put in, the considerations to make them fire retardant weren't, uh, weren't there. So this, although it is, yeah, it was, um, I like the fact that everyone's gone big on that, um, going with brown rat there. It was actually a field mouse. Um, and the guy did show me the picture of the field mouse and, and it was just, um, shall we say, scattered remains. It was, it was pretty atrocious. Um, but this does highlight uh, in, in a fairly dark way what, what rodents are, you know, the, the problems that these guys can cause uh, that we don't necessarily um, appreciate. Now this, this is one that's fun and this is, this is one that I always like to trot out. Um, does anybody know what this is? Um, and it, is it a mealworm larvae? Is it a flea larvae, a mosquito larvae or a domestic larvae? And while you answer, I'll give you some background on where this animal um, is hiding and what it's um, feeding on. Uh, and that might help people make a little bit of a decision as to what this animal is. But you usually find this animal living in um, specifically carpets uh, and you'll find it in carpets um, throughout domestic homes that have people actively in them. Uh, and you can see here uh, this end, you know, this is the uh, anterior end, this is the head end. Um, it, it's been eating um, fecal matter from the adults. So actually the, the larvae is reliant on, uh, not exclusively reliant, but uh, it is quite heavily reliant on the adults because the adults will take a meal and they will then uh, defecate a partially digested fecal pellet. Uh, and it's that fecal pellet that the, the larvae will swim through the carpets and they will look for and they will ingest before they then move on to pupate and become adults themselves. So shall we see what grotty little beastie this came from? Yes, it is a flea larvae. Well done, guys. So yes, flea larvae actually live inside um, the, the pilings of uh, carpets and they feed on the fecal matter of the partially digested blood meals um, of the adults. Uh, and this is, this is one of the reasons why we, we do say um, when you are treating for fleas, it, is, uh, it will increase um, your um, treatment efficacy if you give the floor a really good hoover because you are going to, you know, this, this legless, or if they do have legs, they are very small and not, not very um, effective. Uh, they, they, no, sorry, it's a, technically a, an ancient species of fly, so it won't have legs at all. Um, and so you, if you hoover, you will be taking a lot of these off the floor and you'll be helping to break that cycle. As I mentioned, things were fruit flies and things with a complete metamorphosis. It's important to try and break the cycle at both ends and not just at one end. Now, this, what is this? Is it a hazel dormouse? Uh, is it a skooma vole? Uh, an edible dormouse or a harvest mouse? Now, to pad a little bit while you guys all make a decision on what this could be, um, Anyone working in the Bucks area will potentially have encountered these guys. Uh, they are fairly local to, to Bucks, um, and they were originally brought in uh, many, many moons ago by the Romans. Uh, and then they died out, and then they were brought back in by a guy called Walter Rothschild. Uh, yes, of the same Rothschild family. And Walter Rothschild was a hoot in the sense that he was um, the very definition of a lot of money and not a huge amount of sense. Um, and he used to love collecting animals. If you ever have the opportunity to go to uh, the Tring Museum, which is a branch of the Natural History Museum out in um, High Wycombe or High Wycombe area, um, I would highly recommend it. It's probably one of the largest collections of taxidermied animals uh, in the UK. Uh, and if, if that doesn't tickle your fancy, I'm going to sweeten the deal by telling you that most of this taxidermy is done by, uh, was done by Victorian taxidermists who had never seen the animals at all. Uh, and 
they had a fantastic habit of anthropomorphizing the animals. Um, so you'll have things like weasels, which are sat on the floor looking like something from Ice Age. Like, and you have um, polar bears who look quizzical or lions who just look confused and sad. They've got a full range of facial expressions because um, they didn't know how the animals were meant to look. So they ended up giving them human expressions as they thought would be um, appropriate to that, to that animal. So what did we all think uh, this was? Yes, it is an edible dormouse, um, which are becoming, um, they're moving actually further and further out of um, High Wycombe, and we're starting to find them in uh, areas further and further afield. Um, and if you ever have the, the joy or the, the misery of meeting one, they are actually remarkably um, cute animals as, as far as they go. So on to, I think this may even be the last picture in the picture round. So what is this? Uh, and I'm sorry, there isn't an answer there that says alien, although that would have been fully acceptable. Is this a drain fly pupa? Is it a fruit fly pupa? Is this a litter beetle, a litter beetle pupa? Or is this a mosquito pupa? Um, so just to, to go through some of the defining features here, um, these little tufts on the top here, which, which are, are, are meant to look like, you know, not meant to look like, but they do kind of look like little alien antenna, are, um, uh, is the siphon. So this animal is living um, in or underneath water uh, in almost all of its uh, larval. I've you know, almost given away there, all of its larval, larval life. Uh, and you can see here the development through the sides of the pupil case of, uh, of its like legs, big long legs, and of course, the abdomen, which is going to ultimately just shrink back up this uh, carapace um, shell. Um, but it, it, if you've ever seen these, they are absolutely fascinating. And uh, the, the extreme, yeah, there we go. It's, it's clearly, you know, we all knew what that was. It's a mosquito pupil. And they definitely do look like little alien heads if you see them um, out in the wild. Uh, especially, you know, big things to check, tires, uh, old water tanks, things like that. Right, so this is a bit of fun. So for this one, guys, um, we all have access to the chat, correct? Uh, and we can bring the chat up, and I'll bring the chat up at the side as best I can. Um, but this is a good old anagram round. Uh, and instead of just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give you a little while to do them. But in reality, um, I think we will stop this round when the first person manages to unscramble this word. So we will be able to see, we will be able to sort of like um, cheer and uh, uh, chip you along if you're the first person to get it. So with that in mind, what, and these are all pest animals, I believe. Um, so what pest is an anagram of flit fury? And sitting there and uh, staring at the screen, waiting for someone else to answer the question is completely unacceptable. I want to hear, you know, a, a hundred pens scrabbling frantically on paper, trying to distinguish what this may be. The suspense is literally killing me. Can you see it on there, on there, Alex, on the chat section? People are putting I, I can, them. I, I can, actually, I can't open up the chat at the moment. Oh, there we go. Yes. It's finally popped up for me. Um, Great. Got that remarkably quickly. Wow, <laughs> there is so many of them. Um, yes, Michelle Pope, I think, is the first one out of the bag there. So congratulations, Michelle. It is a fruit fly. So next one up. What animal is wearing evil? And I'll try and bring the chat up again. Oh, Natalie, you might have to help me because... Um, it carry. I, it is while I'm sharing the screen. I can't. I can't bring it up very uh, reliably. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So um, we have got a suggestion: grain weevil from Sean Park. Grain, I think the first one. Grain weevil. It is. Yes. Well done, Sean. <laughs> right, you guys are better at this than I was going to. You know, it. it you are getting them much faster than it took me to make them, and uh, <laughs> it was. So I'm just... having to keep a close eye on it because they are getting them up there quickly. So I'm trying to see that first name and then get it before everyone else comes in. So, <laughs> okay, foiled emus. So we've got field mouse from Luke Jenkins. Oh, crikey! Yes. 
<laughs> field mouse. This is phenomenal. I think some of you um, are missing your calling. I expect us to put this on countdown um, very, very soon. So the last one. The suspense. The suspense. Elliot <laughs> Nesbit Black Cat. Not Black Cat, no. No. Too many C's. I'm waiting. Oh, they're struggling with this one. <laughs> Oh no, still struggling. Oh! Oh, there we go. Black Ant from Tim Green. Black Ant, well done. It is. There we go. <laughs> there we go. So that's it, guys. That was uh, that was the ultimate. That was the last question in the um, in my Christmas quiz. So there we go. I apologise. I thought the chat would have been a, a, an easy way of doing. Oh, there is so many just jumped through there. That's phenomenal. <laughs> well done, guys. Um, so hopefully you all enjoyed that, uh, a little bit of a break from uh, reality, and at the same time, education through fun. Hey! So. Well, we always love that. We always love that, Alex, as always. as It's been lots of fun, and I'm, I bet everyone agrees with, uh, yeah, very good, thank you. And um, do we get a goodie bag, they're asking? Um, I, I, I tell you what, I, I can try something um, for, uh, yeah, certainly for the, the four people who got it first. Um, the winners and i'll see what i can do for you there you go there you go <laughs> fabulous thank you alex as always that's been amazing it's great to see you okay thanks ever so all much all right Thank take you. care bye bye, -bye.